This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the BCHA or its board of directors. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. All right, so uh, just a little bit of background uh, about how I came to do that. I, I'm not a, an expert who works all the time on conspiracy theories, uh, but I do teach a lot of uh, courses in logic and in critical thinking at Simon Fraser University. And I was given the opportunity of uh, teaching a new course about some cool topic that people might be interested in. We always try to get new students in. And I was like, well, what about conspiracy theory? Because this is an interesting topic, and it presents some specific challenges from the point of view of critical thinking. So I thought I would talk about, well, some of those things that uh, I've been uh, thinking about since then. So one of the first uh, interesting <coughs> element about conspiracy theories, uh, what is distinctive about them, is that uh, conspiracy theorists are different from other theorists. So if you compare a conspiracy theorist with a physicist working on uh, you know, some, uh, some uh, thing, whether it's pure or applied, it tends to be quite different from the, the, the way a conspiracy theorist talks. And also, people who believe in conspiracy theories tend to differ uh, from people who believe in other uh, theories. Uh, someone who believes that 9-11 was an inside job uh, has a different uh, attitude towards that theory than a person who, say, would believe in evolution or in special relativity. Okay? There's a much more emotional component that comes with that, and also, uh, is there a feedback? No. no? Okay. I'm the only one hearing that. Huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, th there is a difference there. Uh, and why is that? So that, that's the first question I'd like to talk about a little bit. So one of the thing is that, uh, well, th there are many components to this answer, but one is that the main, the best known conspiracy theorists that we hear about in the media are not people that inspire a great deal of confidence. Uh, here I have Alex Jones, uh, Glenn Beck, and Jesse Ventura, who are, uh, let's say, known for uh, having a less than exemplary level of accuracy in their claims. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be nice here. <laughs> um, now, one of the reasons for that is perhaps not something that has to do with conspiracy theories per se, but more about the sort of environment in which those theories are developed and uh, spread around. So they tend to uh, live on the internet uh, uh, with those amateur videos that are more or less well produced. Uh, and they often connect evidence or information, but we don't know where that comes from. We don't even know if it's real evidence. Um, and as a result, we have something that looks uh, dubious to some extent. This is work which is not done by trained professional, like the work of a scientist who is spending his or her entire life uh, learning to uh, to articulate results with a certain, uh, according to certain standards. So the result is not particularly polished, it's not exactly rigorous, and it attracts a lot of criticism. But at the same time, imagine you had a, uh, an amateur who is not well trained in engineering developing the blueprints for a skyscraper the result would not be very good, right? Uh, it would be a little bit, uh, anyway, that would not be the building I would buy my apartment in. <laughs> uh, but despite that, uh, we wouldn't discredit the entire field of engineering just because some amateur has produced a bad plan for constructing a building, right? 
Uh, so I would like to go past uh, or beyond the fact that there are, let's say, less than competent person producing conspiracy theories and try to understand if there are other reasons for which conspiracy theories tend to look a bit different from regular scientific theories. Now, a second factor that contributes is that often people who believe one conspiracy theory tend to believe many, many more, whether they are related or not. It's sometimes uh, social, uh, social psychologists talk about it uh, as if it was a virus infecting the mind of the people. Um, I like to put it like that, is as if there were uh, gateway conspiracy theories to, uh, to make a, uh, an analogy with gateway drugs. So one day you find yourself mightily uh, questioning the uh, conclusions of the Warren Commission on the assassination of JFK, and soon after you find yourself curled in a back alley thinking that the reptilians are out to get you. Right? <laughs> Um, now, of course, that is a little bit of an exaggeration, but this is certainly a, a phenomenon that deserves to be studied carefully. Uh, I have some uh, data that was gathered by the polling firm in Southwest about the uh, prevalence of some conspiracy theories uh, in the BC population. Uh, so that was from 2013. I couldn't find more recent numbers. They asked 867 BC residents uh, what their beliefs are about a number of topics, some of which are related to conspiracies and some which aren't. Uh, in dark blue, that uh, uh, reveals people believe this idea completely, and in light blue, they uh, somewhat believe it. So, you know, you, you're probably interested in uh, how many people believe in God, given the sort of uh, meeting it is. That's 58%. Um, then UFOs exist, 52%, which is fairly large. JFK assassination, 34. 9-11 was a US government conspiracy, 25. So those are interesting numbers. Uh, in fact, BC is the Canadian province where there is the largest number of people who uh, endorse conspiracy theories. Now, of all those, the one that I find the most interesting is this one that a cure for cancer exists and it has been suppressed. 38% of people in BC believe that. Now, that's two out of five, right? So you're in a bus with 50 people, 20 of them will believe that. And to me, that raises questions because I'm thinking, what does that say about what those people think about the society in which they live? They, are, they, they, they must think that society is not there to help, but rather they are under siege, right? Uh, now, it is always rational to act according to what we believe, uh, and that is the case even if the beliefs that uh, we do entertain are, let's say, uh, suboptimal. <laughs> uh, so if you do think that, uh, peop that, 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 say, the government will let uh, probably hundreds of thousands of people die from cancer uh, for profit motive or something else, uh, what would be the proportionate action that you would take? What would be the rational reaction? Uh, and I think that, that, that is a little bit scary because you should not just sit there and do nothing. Uh, recently, you might have heard about this Pizzagate incident. Do you all know what that is? Okay, so this is an American conspiracy theory according to which some particular pizza shop would have had a uh, traffic of uh, sex slaves that were all children in their basement and that uh, Hillary Clinton was behind all of that. Okay, so one man walked with a semi-automatic rifle in the pizza shop and walked straight to the door to the back to go in the basement and check whether that was actually there. And then I was thinking about that. Was that an irrational reaction? I mean, if you think there is actually children that are being held captive in this basement, that would be the normal reaction, right? So 
to me, this is one, one well, anyway, <laughs> that, that would not be entirely crazy to do that, to try to save those children. Uh, so this is why I think it's interesting. It's important that we think about conspiracy theories. Because if we're right about them, or if we're wrong about them, there are huge consequences that, comes, uh, that come with that with respect to how we regard the society that we live in. But there are different ways of distinguishing uh, conspiracy theories from other theories. So far, I've mostly been talking about the difference between the theorists and the believers in those theories. And now I would like to, th those are good topics, mostly for psychology and sociology. Now I would like to focus uh, on the difference between the theories per se and how they relate to the evidence that we would like to propose to uh, give them justification. And this is more along my, up my alley because it has to do with epistemology, which is a branch of philosophy that tries to characterize uh, what it means to know things in a justified manner. Uh, philosophy of science and critical thinking are also the things I do, so this is why today I'm going to talk about this uh, second component, mostly. And then, if you want, we can talk about the first one more in the Q&A. Now, how do we distinguish conspiracy theories from others? One thing that people often say uh, that we could perhaps uh, uh, think about uh, is that it's not conspiracy theory when you have a proof. Or it's not conspiracy theory when it's true. People often say that. So what implications would that have for the questions I've just raised about the difference between conspiracy theories and other theories? Well, the idea is that conspiracy theories would differ <laughs> from, uh, by the fact that uh, they would be false or unsubstantiated, which let's say would not be the case for special relativity or the theory of evolution or, uh, okay, I was gonna give a, an example in economics, but that's harder. <laughs> now, a little bit more abstract. Why, why do I disagree with that point of view? So the claim that T, where T is just a letter I'm using for a putative theory, if T is true, then T is not a conspiracy theory. Now, to, to, to say that and believe that this is true supposes one of the following two things. The first one is if it's true, then it's not a theory, which seems wrong because there are true theories, right? Uh, I, I remember uh, studying some of them in school, and I do teach some of them now. <laughs> uh, the second one is if it's true, then it's not about conspiracies. Well. That is also bizarre because there are true stories about conspiracies. Uh, I mean, it's part of the legal code. People get charged every year for committing conspiracy. So that one also seems false, okay? So the common saying that if it's true or if, it's, uh, if you have proof for it, then it's not a conspiracy theory seems to be bogus. So that will not be the sense in which conspiracy theories will differ from other theories. We'll have to look for something else. And just to emphasize that point even more, I'd like to mention a few conspiracy theories that are very, very likely to be true or already known to be true. You know this company, Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, they make your aspirins, they might make other things that you take. Uh, they, they're very helpful, but not always. Uh, from, nine, uh, from the late 1970s to 1985, they were making a uh, plasma concentrate uh, a treatment uh, to, uh, in which they were uh, adding proteins to help hemophiliacs, right? So uh, hemophilia is when you, uh, you blood and uh, the blood doesn't coagulate uh, as quickly as it should. And this was an injection that they could uh, 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 take that would uh, prevent that from happening. Now, over that period of time, uh, they infected a lot of people with hepatitis C and HIV because the plasma they were using was in fact contaminated. Uh, 
Some of it was because not, not much was known about HIV at the beginning. And some of it was just uh, cutting corners to try to save a little bit of money, uh, like pooling all the donations in with one big container to make sure that all the viruses can spread around in all of the batches. Uh, just in Canada, 60,000 peop 60, people were infected with hepatitis C and 2,000 uh, with HIV. So, so far it's not a conspiracy theory yet. Uh, but here's the additional information. Now, by January 1983, uh, Bayer's management uh, acknowledged that uh, probably their uh, plasma concentrates were contaminated with both hepatitis C and uh, HIV, and that uh, this was contributing to the uh, AIDS epidemic. Uh, and then a little bit later, in June uh, 1983, they had found a way to uh, uh, make their treatment for hemophilia in a different way that was passing all the detection tests for HIV. Uh, in fact, they were still contaminated. Uh, it's just the tests were not very good. But they thought that they were not contaminated. Right? That, that, that's the important part. Despite that, they kept making the old contaminated, contaminated medicine until August 84. And they kept selling it in Asia and Latin America. Of course, they stopped selling it in, in the US and Canada because, well, we would have found out. But they kept selling it to Asia and Latin America for basically two years after they knew. Uh, it's insane. And there is a big cover-up that's associated with it. Uh, in 2011, Bayer uh, acknowledged that they had paid uh, at least $600 million in settlement, but they settled all their lawsuits so they wouldn't have to accept any uh, guilt, any responsibility. To me, that's, that's clearly a conspiracy theory, and it is true, and this is why we need to study conspiracy theories. There are many more that we could mention. Some of you might have heard about the Tuskegee experiments in the US in which the uh, Department of Health Services, I think I'm getting the acronym wrong, but anyway, uh, uh, for 40 years was involved in a research project about syphilis on uh, um, African Americans. And uh, they did not treat them for 25 years after they knew that penicillin was curing it. Uh, the Glywitz incident, it's a different one. It's when the Nazis uh, staged attacks on themselves, uh, putting the blame on Poland uh, in order to uh, start the invasion. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident is the alleged attack from North Vietnam on an American ship uh, which started the Vietnam War. That never happened. <laughs> they, and then they covered up. At first, they thought it happened. And it, it's complicated, I don't want to go into details. Project MKUltra is when uh, the CIA was testing LSD and other mind control technology on people without their consent, and a number of people died. Uh, FBI forensic cover-up is more recent, it's from the 90s, after the FBI found out that a lot of their forensics method based on hair uh, examination were bogus, they kept using them and protect their uh, expert witnesses. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all of them, but since I'm from Quebec City, I still believe that this goal that was disallowed in 1987 <laughs> against the Habs is definitely part of a conspiracy. <laughs> we have a long memory. <laughs> and when the Nordics will come back, we will, uh, we will bring that up again. <laughs> all right. Now, perhaps some of you uh, who are very uh, skeptic Skeptical? Yeah, towards conspiracy theories would tell me, well, I mean, they are not really conspiracy theories. So now we have to start arguing a little bit about how we're going to define our terms. And arguing about what is a good definition of a term is a notoriously difficult thing to do. Why? Because there is some uh, level of arbitrariness in how we assign meaning to to, to words that we employ. So how are we going to do that? 
Well, to me, one of the most important thing uh, for this particular topic is to make sure that we do not prejudge the situation uh, by the way we define things. So we want to have definitions that are sufficiently broad that we are going to be uh, able to carry out a serious inquiry according to the canons of critical thinking. Okay, So we don't want empirical questions as to whether there was a conspiracy involved in some uh, event uh, to become just a matter of definition. That would, that would not, if we define our terms so that this would happen, we would not be very responsible inquirers. So I'm going to propose a few uh, distinctions and a, a little bit of terminology here. First, I would like to introduce the term a conspiracy topic. So what's a conspiracy topic? It's a topic with which uh, conspiracy theories are very often associated. Uh, UFOs, Area 51, JFK, Marilyn Monroe, the Vietnam War, the moon landing, all those things. Okay. Now notice here we're not making any statement about what happened. It's just a topic that we often talk about in the context of conspiracy theories. For the term conspiracy theory per se, I would like to propose the following uh, definition, which is very much in line with the way I think about things when I do philosophy of science. So a conspiracy theory is part of an answer to a why question. What's a why question? It's just an answer, that, a question that begins with why. And after that, we have a phenomenon. Why is it that this phenomenon happened? So an answer to a why question uh, that, uh, and a why question, by the way, asks for an explanation. So uh, an answer to a why question about a certain sequence of events that happen. And if that explanation uh, uh, relies on a sort of production mechanism, uh, which involves a conspiracy, then we have a conspiracy theory. So a conspiracy theory is an explanation. And part of the explanation is that some people have conspired together. I mean, that seems like obvious, right? If you were to look at dictionaries and definitions, that's not what they give. They give much more loaded definitions that normally are uh, inherently derogatory or things like that. So I tried to stay away from that here. Now notice that in general, with a particular conspiracy topic, there's going to be a large number of conspiracy theories that will be uh, associated. OK, so now. One thing that I also tried to not mention is whether conspiracy theories are good or evil, right? Because that's always part of the story. So here, suppose S, some sequence of event happens. Then we're just going to ask, why is it that this sequence of event happened? And then we're going to answer, because, uh, because E, where E is just my explanation, right? So I'm going to give an explanation. Now, is my explanation involving a conspiracy theory or not? Well, if my explanation involves a conspiracy theory, I am doing conspiracy theory. If it is not, then I'm not doing conspiracy theory. And again, I, I try to keep it quite neutral here. Uh, but now that leaves open the big question, what is a conspiracy? Again, uh, all the dictionaries and encyclopedia I've looked at disagree on that. They mention a lot of things that we might want to include. Uh, one is that we have to coordinate towards a common objective. Well, that, that, seem, that seems right, right? Well, when we're planning something, uh, we try to have a common objective. Also, this plot or agreement of plan has to be secret. That, that seems right. Uh, but then they say also it has to be unlawful, wrongful, bad, or harmful. In the legal definition of a conspiracy, that is the case, because we're trying to define a, a criminal offense. But in the broader context, uh, there might be conspiracies that are not criminal, that are not wrong uh, inherently. So I would tend to leave that element out Often people say it also has to be, uh, uh, the plan has to be hatched by powerful conspirators or governments or things like that. 
I don't think so. I, I think uh, regular people like us can definitely conspire together if we decide to do that. So I would not include that. I mean, uh, it's my right as a Canadian to conspire if I want. <laughs> um, sometimes they say that the event that we're trying to make happen has to be unpleasant or something like that. Again, I don't see why that would be the case. Uh, Sometimes they say it has to contradict conventional wisdom or uh, be derogatory. I'll have examples later according to which the conventional wisdom is a conspiracy theory. So I think that's also incorrect. So which elements should we include? There's a nice book. It's called Modern Conspiracy, The Importance of Being Paranoid. There are good things and bad things in that book, but it's, it's really good food for thought. And that's what they have to say about how we're going to define the term conspiracy. Conspiracy, the act of conspiring, is certainly reprehensible in a case such as Watergate, but it is not inherently noxious. In fact, politics, business, and even family units would struggle to function in recognizable forms if they were deprived of the ability to conspire about election strategies, marketing campaign, and birthday presents. Right? So, when you're trying to get with your brothers and sisters to secretly buy a present for your parents, you are engaging in a conspiracy. <laughs> Not a very bad one, unless that's really, you're buying them something they don't want. <laughs> so I propose to say that a conspiracy is just the activity of secretly planning with other people, so we need at least two. Uh, to cause a particular sequence of events to happen. So then we have a conspiracy and we can ask, is it a malevolent or a benevolent conspiracy? And we know that there will be some on both sides. On the malevolent side, you might have a conspiracy to achieve world domination or for corruption. I saw some stories in the newspapers about BC politics recently. Um, fraud, which we're very familiar with in Quebec. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but also you have the good conspiracies, the one that, that are, say, uh, you're going to run out of gas on an airplane and the crew is keeping it from the people on the plane so they don't panic and start beating each other up. Right? That would decrease the odds that they would do a good emergency landing. So that would be a benevolent conspiracy. Uh, or. Uh, keeping from the public information about some financial trouble so there's not a bank run that would make things, make things even worse. Uh, sometimes you want to help people against their will. So um, you're at the bar drinking with friends and then you plot with some of your friends to steal the car keys from the drunk one who's gonna drive. <laughs> That's a conspiracy also. Okay, so those are the definitions I propose. And as a result of those definitions, I will suggest that there is two and only two ways of criticizing conspiracy theory. The first one is that there is no compelling evidential ground for believing that there was a conspiracy. And the second is even if there are rational grounds for thinking that there was a conspiracy, that it is not the best explanation of how things happen. And I would say those are your only two lines of attack. But of course, a lot comes with each of those two things. So next things we have to do is talk a little bit about what's a good explanation and what is good evidential support for a conspiratorial claim. So that's what we'll do. Uh, philosophers of science have written hundreds of books and thousands of papers about explanation. They develop so many accounts of explanation that I could easily talk about it all day. And in fact, I could probably talk until next week's uh, meeting, but I won't. Uh, so <laughs> I will just try to narrow it down to uh, the most essential component, at least the way I see it. So the objective of an explanation is, is to uh, obtain some degree of understanding of uh, what is happening in the world. And the key, the rough, the, the rough version of the general idea that we're going to use to judge the quality of an explanation is this. So 
What's an explanation? Well, an explanation is an argument. And that's an argument we offer to, to, to show that the events that happened um, were much more likely to happen according to a certain uh, set of factors that might involve particular facts or laws of nature or things like that than for any other given set of factors. So if we can make that argument, then we have, um, <clears throat> sorry, th then, then we have uh, justified our claim that this set of factors is the one that best explains the sequence of events that we have observed. Now, when there is a, a certain number of events associated with what we're trying to explain, uh, that are not very well accounted for by a proposed explanation, with respect to that proposal, we'll say that this is an anomaly. And that happens very often in the context of uh, conspiracy theories. You're all familiar with the conspiracy theory that 9-11 was an inside job, I presume. Otherwise, you would probably not be here. <laughs> uh, well. One anomaly that uh, conspiracy theorists often bring up is that on that day, uh, it's not only the two towers that, that fell. There was this other building, World, World Trade Center Building 7, that also uh, uh, fell apart. And it was not even mentioned in the official congressional commission. Uh, and it's very hard to figure out why that building would have fell on its own as a result of the events. People often mention that. Uh, I, I, I don't want to commit to any of that, but that, that would be considered an anomaly. Okay? Uh, so often, if we want to judge the explanatory value of a conspiratorial claim, we're going to try to find whether they are anomalies. And we can try to find anomalies both in the official stories and in a conspiracy theory. So that's going to be a very good tool that we're going to employ. Now, if uh, you uh, paid careful attention to what I said, you will have noticed that there is a fundamentally contrastive element in how we judge uh, the quality of explanations. We always judge an explanation in comparison with a class, a set of potential uh, explanations. So that raises a question. In the case of conspiracy theories, what else is in this class to which we will compare a conspiracy theory? What theories often stand in contrast to it? And often, well, that's going to be the so-called official story, right? Uh, we have the official story, and then conspiracy theorists come in, and they propose an alternative account, which is a conspiracy theory. But is it necessarily so? Is it necessarily the case that the official story is not a conspiracy theory? Oh, well, I will suggest no. Often, the only choices that we have are, in fact, conspiracy theories. And the question is not, is the event to be explained uh, by appealing to a conspiracy or not? The question is, which conspiracy explains the events? A good one is the Columbine High School massacre from 1999. I, I know my examples are old, but <laughs> uh, there, that, that's a good one. So the official story is that two kids, Eric Harris and uh, Dylan Klebold, I'm sorry. That's hard to pronounce for me. Uh, planned an attack on their own high school. They planned that for more than a year. They did a lot of research online. They tested their weapons. Uh, they even test bombs that they made ahead of time. And then uh, on the fateful day, April 20th, they carried out the attack. They murdered 12 students, one teacher, and uh, injured another 21 person. So that's the official account. Is that a conspiracy? Yeah, you had two people planning secretly to have something happen. If they had not committed suicide, they would have been charged for conspiracy, right? So it is a conspiracy. And then you have Alex Jones' cuckoo story. Uh, well, sorry if you think it is correct. Yeah. <laughs> I should not have said that. Uh, 
The alleged attack was a false flag operation orchestrated by the FBI. No one was actually killed. It was staged by actors. Uh, and the purpose was to justify gun control because you take gun control, you take guns from people in order to replace American democracy by a tyrannical regime, probably led by Obama or Satanist or something like that. Maybe reptilians. I'm not sure what his views are on that. OK, probably, yeah, Marxists must be involved somehow. <laughs> So that's also a conspiracy theory. So here, say, if we consider those two options, our choice is between two conspiracy theories. So the, the fact that there are cases like that, to me, means, well, we have to engage into <coughs> critical thinking about conspiracy theories. It is really part of the, of the world in which we live. OK, so I, I didn't want to talk for too long about explanations. Uh, the explanatory component, because I don't think there's all that much that is new to say about it. I think uh, conspiracy theories and regular scientific theories are very similar with respect to the uh, explanatory component. But I think there are more difference when it comes to the uh, evidential component, how we use evidence to justify those conspiracy theories. Um, there, there's a lot of them uh, that I could talk about, uh, but I will not do all of those because well, we have only like 20 minutes left. So uh, there's stuff about arguments from authority because we have to rely on what the experts say, but which ones are the real experts, and it's very controversial in the case of conspiracy theories. Then there's the issue of anonymous sources. How are we supposed to trust that? And then there's another thing that journalists call doubly anonymous source, uh, because it might be the case that the journalist knows who the source is, but uh, agrees to not name that person. That's singly anonymous, anonymous source. But when the journalist doesn't know even who the source is, the journalist is not in a position to vouch for that source, which makes the information even more questionable. Often there are eyewitnesses. There's a lot of interesting literature about how, how unreliable eyewitnesses are. Uh, so people who study law go over that uh, in all sorts of details. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on today the most is how it is, how is, how likely is it that we can keep things secret, completely airtight? among a large group of conspirators over a long-ish period of time. Um, this is particularly tricky. Uh, and then there are many, many other things that have to do with uh, misinformation and ideological warfare and uh, how, how much we can trust the information which is publicly available and things like that. Uh, but I, I really want to focus on that one for today because I've done a little bit of work last week on that. So I was like, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, so, okay, we're going to talk about how secrecy impacts the evidence gathering associated with conspiracy theories. Now, conspiracy theories are fun partly because of the fact that they are often associated with conspiracy theories, right? Uh, I saw a lot of secret handshakes when I walked in. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, but of course, uh, there are varying uh, levels of secrecy among those societies. Uh, for example, we might ask, uh, is their membership secret or not? For example, if you take the Freemasons, which is one that people love to talk about, well, the membership is not secret, right? Uh, but if you take the Illuminati, which would be the sketchy, uh, group that infiltrated the Freemason, then their membership would be secret. In fact, everything would be secret about them. Now, what about their traditions, their practice, their history? Is that public or secret information? What about their objective, uh, what they're trying to accomplish? Often, a, 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 a cons uh, sorry, a secret society that acknowledges that it exists publicly will give an explanation for why they're keeping some of those elements secret. And then you might ask, does it make sense? 
If it makes sense, then that might just be a benevolent conspiratorial group or maybe just a social group, right? Uh, so that there's nothing wrong about that. Uh, and then you can ask about their records and all of that. If we look at uh, the historical records about uh, secret society, we find all sorts of combination of those four elements. Now, some are so secret, I mentioned the Illuminati, that it's really hard to even determine if they actually exist or if they are the pure figment of our imagination. Uh, I, I, I watch all those conspiracy videos about Illuminati and I'm still trying to see, to find the evidence that they actually exist today. I know they existed back in the 18th century, but do they exist today? That's what I want to know. It's very tricky. The more secret, the harder it is to determine what exists and what does not. So typically because there is a, uh, a plan uh, that must be carried out in secret, you can expect the conspirators to suppress the evidence that would give away the cons that would support the theory on purpose. Okay? So there's a, a famous slogan by Carl Sagan. I love Carl Sagan's slogans. Uh, I, I think, I, but I'm not sure from who it is, but it's often attributed to Carl Sagan. Uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And that's a, a slightly different point, which is to say, well, it's not because we don't have evidence that something exists, uh, that we have evidence that it doesn't exist, right? But now there's something even more spooky with secret society because we know that the information is, would be repressed, uh, suppressed on purpose. Huh? They don't want us to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, God. and we're just talking about suppressing information. Okay, so back, back to it. <laughs> And we'll have to double our effort to stay concentrated. It's going to be really hard. Um, OK, but I was saying, uh, I was talking about this uh, uh, slogan by Carl Sagan, according to which absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And I was saying that in the context of conspiracy theories, there is something even more spooky in the sense that if there was a conspiracy, then you would have reasons to think that the evidence is suppressed on purpose. So you have something, oh, again. Mm -hmm. So you have something that's even bizarre, that in a way, absence of evidence is evidence of presence, right? <laughs> uh, I, I admit that it is a very weak sense, it is a very weak piece of evidence, but it is there, right? That's what you would expect them to do. <laughs> um, so I find that, that a little bit interesting, and that definitely is something that differs uh, with conspiracy theory. You don't have that in the context of regular scientific theories, whether you're doing physics or economics or sociology or, or maybe sometimes in psychology, but in any case. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so this is a particular, uh, particularly interesting thing. Um, now, because you would expect that a lot of the evidence that you could possibly obtain to justify a claim that there was a group of conspirators behind uh, something, uh, because you know this evidence is suppressed, the question of assessing how likely it is that there was a conspiracy is particularly tricky. But let's try to think about it in a more abstract way, trying to figure out what are the factors that we should take into consideration to assess how probable it is that there was a conspiracy, uh, or, or, or that a group of conspirators, sorry, a group of conspirators uh, were uh, at work, and how likely it is that they could carry out their plan without the uh, conspiracy uh, becoming public, okay? So definitely, the more conspirators you have, the less likely that they will be able to keep it airtight, right? There would be someone that would give away this information. Again, 
So there would be someone who would leak the information. I mean, the leaking is a very popular topic these days because the Trump administration specializes in it. Uh, but that is a general phenomenon. Also, the longer the conspiracy has to be, the less likely it is that they could uh, carry it out without there being a leak at some point, right? Uh, also, uh, it's going to depend on conspirator. Okay, it should be conspirator. <laughs> uh, how likely it is that a conspirator would leak the information over a certain period of time? That is to say, how reliable the conspirators are. If you're trying to, uh, to do a conspiracy to arrange a birthday party for, uh, uh, for a friend or your parents or whatnot, odds are that it will be leaked because, well, they always do, right? My, sis my sister would say something, for sure. She's, she has a very high probability of leaking the information over any period of time. <laughs> but if it's a highly trained NSA agent, uh, who is picked because uh, one thing that he or she would be very reliable, or if it is a, hypothetically a, 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 an Illuminati which has been picked among millions of Freemasons for being very reliable, then we would think that those persons would not leak the information too easily. And finally, there's uh, the probability of being exposed by a third party. Uh, say, an investigative journalism. Uh, so those of you who have studied history will know what an investigative journalist is. <laughs> now, one of the question is, how should one combine those factors to assess the probability as a whole that there would be a leak of information over a certain period of time? Because Why, why do we need to know that information? Because if there were a leak, then we would know about the conspiracy. We would not have to speculate, right? We have to speculate because we have reasons to suspect that it is remaining secret. Now, recently, there was a paper published in a journal that was arguing that it was very, <laughs> that was very <laughs> unlikely that, uh, uh, that, that conspiracies would be, uh, the, the, the full secrecy would be preserved in a group of conspirators over time. Uh, that's the paper. It's called On the Viability of Conspiratorial Beliefs. And I read that paper and I thought that was really interesting because it was developing a mathematical model to assess that. And a good part of what I do is work in applied mathematics. So I see equations, I'm thinking, yay, it's going to be fun. I might be the only one in the room. <laughs> now, the paper was full of mistakes. So I start reading that paper, and all the math was wrong. So I re-derived everything. And I came up with that beautiful equation. So now you know everything they were, they need, you need to know about it. Oh, maybe not. Well. So I, did, uh, I wrote a little program so we can run a few little tests and play to see how that, that whole thing behaves. So just to give you ideas uh, from based on real world data, uh, the NSA PRISM conspiracy that was uh, uh, revealed by Edward Snowden, how many years ago? Yeah. Something like seven years ago, right? Um, I, I don't remember. <laughs> but um, according to uh, people who have looked into that, probably there would have been 30,000 NSA employees that would have worked on that project. So that's a lot of people in a conspiracy. Uh, since the inception of the program to when it was leaked, it took six years. And based on their estimate of how reliable NSA agents are, the probability that they would leak the information over a one-year period individually is four in one million. So it's a very, very small probability. Uh, they also looked into the Tuskegee syphilis experiments that I have mentioned earlier. That one would have, in, have involved 6,700 people, which is still a fairly large group of conspirators. 
Uh, and it took 25 years before it was uh, revealed, before it was exposed. So you see that the number of conspirators and the duration, the, the amount of time it takes before there is a leak, seems to be very closely related. Also, we see that those uh, uh, employees were as reliable as NSA agents, about four, four uh, the, the odds were four in a million. And then the FBI forensic scandal, which I mentioned earlier also, involved about 500 people. Uh, it also took six years before it was leaked, but uh, the odds of them leaking the information was about two in 10,000, which is, uh, well, a thousand times higher, right? So that shows that FBI people are way less good at keeping secret than S NSA people. But just to, oh, I should talk here, but, oh, okay. <laughs> um, anyway, with all the noise, we're already in trouble, right? So just to give you um, a little bit of an idea, so, uh, I, I don't want to bother you with the math, but here, suppose we were to take uh, 100 conspirators and we were to say they're about as reliable as an FBI agent, uh, and uh, we run the uh, experiment for 50 years. So, so basically, I have this little, uh, there is, okay, sorry. It's gonna make a picture. That's what I want. <laughs> so what does that picture mean? So we're going to look at the red line. The red line is the probability that the, there would have been a, look, a leak by one of the members of this group. Uh, I said five, five, 500, I think. Uh, 500 people as reliable as uh, um, FBI investigators. Basically, the idea is that after 50 years, the odds that someone would have leaked the information is still about only 5%. So it is possible okay, to, keep, uh, to keep a secret. But if we just change the numbers a little bit, for example, suppose I'm planning a secret birthday party for my mom, okay, and I'm doing that with my sisters and uh, my in-laws and maybe a couple of friends of my mom. Let's say just 10 people. And we're gonna say the odds that we leak the information over a one month period is probably 1% individually. I'm being generous, it's higher than that. So let's enter this number and we're gonna see how long it would take before that would be leaked. <laughs> so basically we'll look at the red curve again. Uh, here now it's not number of years but number of months. And basically, after five months, there would have, there would have been about a 40% chances that someone in that group would have told my mom what we're doing. If we go to a year, it would be 70%, so we're better not to start planning too early, right? <laughs> uh, if we're, say, planning a 25th anniversary and we're starting five years ahead of time, then that's sure someone will give it away and that it will not stay a secret. So, why do we, uh, why is it interesting to have a model like that? Well, because it is extremely hard to have direct information to support the claim that there is a conspiracy, that, that there is a group of people acting in secret. But by doing work like this, we have outside indirect information to judge how likely it is that were there to, to be a group of conspirators, they would have managed to keep it a secret. So this is, this is quite interesting, and the model matches the historical data quite well, so it, it, that's encouraging. I have more examples, but I will not go there. Um, and we're starting to run out of time, so uh, I, will, I will skip my last section. I organized it so I would have a last section I can skip if I'm running out of time. And now we just say, maybe we started being skeptical about conspiracy theories, but now should we start taking measurements to uh, make your uh, own personalized tinfoil hat? <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. <laughs>